Amen. If you have your Bible, Bible, turn to the book of Daniel, chapter 4, with me tonight, please. Daniel, um, not Daniel, Galatians. <laughs> I'll get here in a minute. <laughs> Galatians, chapter number 4. It's amazing how you have something on your mind, and, and uh, it goes that way. Galatians 4. And we're, this is what you call the heart of the Pauline epistles. Galatians chapter number 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors till the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage to the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because your sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son to your, in his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Father, bless this holy book now. Thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul uses a very familiar uh, cultural thing here in the book of Galatians chapter number 4. Uh, adoption was found in uh, a lot of different cultures. I personally believe that he's referring to the Roman culture because we're dealing with, uh, with uh, a time appointed. It says, verse 2, the time appointed the father. And they tell you if you do a little research into it that the Roman father could choose any time he wanted to to make a distinction about his son. Now the book of Galatians is written to defend the gospel, chapter number 1. We know that uh, the apostle Peter had uh, vacillated with the Judaizers, had given in to them, and it was affecting the truth of the gospel. And folks, that's the most important thing in the Bible. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. You can build all kinds of religious structures, but if you don't have that, you're on shifting sand. The Lord Jesus Christ is the foundation and basis of this Bible. He's the chief cornerstone. He's that stone cut out of a mountain that will soon smite that image on its feet. And when he does, total destruction takes place. And there will be a new king and a new kingdom on this earth. So the Lord Jesus is absolutely the great subject of all the Bible. The book of Galatians deals with Judaizers, as I've mentioned to you so many times before. And the Apostle Paul addresses this in the book of Galatians because he wants uh, the Apostle, not only Apostle Peter, but everybody else to understand that if you take the law, you're cursed. If you allow yourself to be a son of the promise, you're blessed. So you only have two different groups here in Galatians, those that are cursed and those that are blessed. We are blessed through our father Abraham. The Bible says that God would bless not through seeds, but through thy seed, which is Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the seed of Abraham that God uses to bless. But the word seed, S-E-E-D, think about it a moment. Have you ever gone to the store and bought a bag of seeds? Or do you buy a bag of seed? Of course you do. Seed. And there are many seeds. There are many down through the Jewish bloodline. But there's only one seed, singular, the Lord Jesus Christ. And from him, all the blessings flow. Now, he's going to tell you about something tonight as it relates to Christ. It's very, very important because we get into the doctrine of adoption. Think about this for a moment now. Adoption. And notice the context of it. Verse number one, that a child differeth nothing from a slave. That's what the word servant means here, though he be Lord of all. He's an heir, he's a child, and he's, he's with the slaves. And uh, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So therefore, we have two analogies to make here. One is that this refers back to Israel is a nation, that they were under the law, therefore they were under tutors. And the Bible says that the law would bring us to Christ, and it did. The purpose of the law was to make us conscious of that. But the second thing here is the individual, because we have the individual crying, Abba, Father. And this is the part that I want to pay attention to tonight. 
If you ever do a study in the Bible, do one on contingencies, because that's a powerful doctrine in the Word of God. What's that mean, preacher? When the Lord told them that, uh, that John the Baptist could have been Elias, who was so forth to, was forth to come, that's a contingency. In the book of Acts chapter number 2, when they, Peter said, Repent, for, for the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. I think that's chapter 3 or 4. That's a contingency. Because what's happening there is that if Israel had finally accepted their Messiah, we would not have had 2,000 years of church age. That's a contingency. The first contingency in the Bible is don't eat this tree. You can eat all the other trees of the garden. If Adam had not eaten of that tree, he'd still be alive in the body that God put him in. He'd still be here. But he ate it, therefore death came upon him. So it was a contingency. He said it's necessary that the scripture be fulfilled. It's going to happen. But woe to that man by whom it is fulfilled. That's a contingency. So for whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. That's a contingency because it's an offering to you and you make a choice. You need to understand tonight that the one thing that elevates us so far above everything else is the fact that we have a will. We can make choices. We can choose to follow the Lord or we can choose to reject him. And I want you to notice where God does some choosing here. And this is a beautiful picture. Here in Galatians chapter number 4, let's take it not talking about Israel as a national thing where God adopted them, and he did. He adopted them as his sons and daughters in the Old Testament. But we're going to talk about the individual salvation tonight because we are saved individually. Chapter number 4 and verse 1 says, Now I say that the heir, and we are, we, we are heirs and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean? That means that we have an inheritance coming. We're going to inherit something. Now note carefully. The child, as long as he, that the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. He's a Lord, but he's no difference between him and a servant. Verse 2. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So the father in Roman culture is a type of our father, the Lord God Almighty, because he's the one now, our father. Our Father, in chapter number 4 the book of Galatians, who's doing something. Look at verse number 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. To redeem means to buy back, to purchase back, to bring back to himself. And that's where you came from. That's where human beings came from. Monkeys, no. But human beings, yes. There is a vast difference between you and a monkey. And there's a lot of difference between you and the professor that tells you you're a monkey, too. Amen. A big difference because we've been made in the image of God. Now, I want you to look carefully at this. When God saved your soul... He wrote your name, the Lamb's Book of Life. You became, you became at that moment, a son of God. That is your state. That will never change. Your state is inviolable. It's immutable. From that moment on, you are what you are until you come into the presence of the Lord. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. These things do not change. But what we're looking at tonight is not so much your state as it is your standing. Because you see, adoption has to do with what you're going to do with somebody. Look at the verse. At the time, verse number 2, at the appointed time of the father, he reaches into the place to where his son is located, but his son is with slaves. So he reaches into where his son is and takes him out. And the moment that he takes him out from among the slaves, it becomes very obvious that this boy was not a slave. This boy was Lord of all, and he belonged to the Father. And therefore he reached in there and pulled him out. And the standing that he gives him here, he adopts him. And what does that mean? That means that he gives him a legal right to everything the Father has to give in glory and power and honor and goodness. The gifts and everything like that are given to him 
because of the adoption. And adoption is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing that connects you with God the Father in a way that nothing else does. Now note carefully, this adoption, notice carefully, verse number one, though he be Lord of all, he's already Lord, see, are you following me now? Verse number one, he already belongs to the Lord. He's Lord of all. But when the father reaches in and pulls him out and makes it known, this is my son. This is the adoption that takes place so that others will know. And this adoption has only begun when God called you out from this world. For when you were in this world, you were not, you were, you were separate from God. You were not where, you, you were not where God could bless you in this world. You didn't belong to the Lord. But when he reached in and called you out of this world, by doing that, he made it known that you belong to him. Amen. Now look carefully. This is important. When he called you out, where did he call you from? He called you from the clutches of Satan. Satan is the god of this world. And the Bible said, He hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God, should shine unto them. See? You either belong to the Lord or you belong to Satan. One or the other. Tonight, I look at you, we fellowship together, and the fellowship we're talking about is that we have things in common. That's what the word fellowship means in uh, First Timothy, in First Peter, in First John. It is koinonia. It means in common. These are things that we share together. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I love the Lord Jesus Christ. We share that one with another. Do you have a spirit living inside you that wasn't in there before but has moved into you? So do I. We share that in common. Do you have a hope inside your soul that you would like to see the Lord Jesus come back? That you want to see him come? So do I. That is something we have in common. Do you have inside your soul a clear understanding that you're not what you used to be? That you've come out of that world? That something has changed inside of you whether you ever told a soul about it or not? You have been transformed from a child of hell to a child of God. Has that happened to you? That's happened to me. We have that in common. But the churches are full of religious people. They believe all the things the Bible says to believe. You can, you can put them through catechisms or anything that you want to do, and you can ask them the question, sure, I believe that. Sure, I believe this. I believe that. I believe this. I believe that. Well, then you're a Christian if you believe these things. No, you're not. The only one that can make you a Christian is God the Father. He's the only one. He's the only one that can save your soul. So now look carefully at this as it begins to develop. But in verse number 4 it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman. Now this is the Apostle Paul's reference to the virgin birth. It's clear as it can be right here. Not made of a man, but made of a woman. The only human being that had anything to do with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was the virgin daughter of Zion. It was the virgin Mary. That's the only one. No, other, no human being had anything to do with his birth outside of Mary. And Mary, of course, was, uh, was uh, with child of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he told Elizabeth. He's with child of the Holy Ghost. So in verse number four, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now here we go. He wants you to know that you are saved and you're born again, but he's going to give you the benefits that come with adoption. And that's what makes all the difference in what I'm going to try to teach to you tonight. Adoption. That's a remarkable thing, too, because if you uh, turn with me to the book of uh, Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 23. The slave was never allowed to call his master father. That did not happen. The slave could never call him father. Why? Because he wasn't his father. He was a slave. He was a servant. And unless he was redeemed, he would stay a slave and stay a servant. But in the book of Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 23, And not only they, 
but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. See that? You notice carefully. God gave you the Holy Spirit. That is the earnest of your inheritance. The Holy Spirit. You say, a preacher, what's the Holy Ghost? Then you don't have him. Period. How many of you in here tonight are breathing? Raise your hand. And you can see me up here. Raise your hand. And, and you're not stretched out somewhere with no life in your body whatsoever. You're sitting here alive. How many of you, how many of you fully understand you're alive tonight? Raise your hand. You know the difference between a dead body and a live person, right? All right. The, prof the difference is just as profound with the new birth. If the Holy Spirit has not moved into you and set himself up inside your soul, and wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life and sealed you by the Holy Spirit and your spirit was born again. And you don't know that? You talk to some people out here in the churches, they'll ask if they're born again and say, oh, I hope so. They don't know him. They don't know him. They don't know him. Because I know tonight I'm alive. I know I'm breathing. I know I can see you. Uh, how much time I have left, that's to the Almighty. But as, as far as I am standing here before you tonight, nobody's got to tell me I'm alive. I don't need somebody to confirm to me that I'm alive. I know I am. And if you've been born of the Spirit of the living God, you don't need one soul on the face of this earth to confirm that to you. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't, matter, it doesn't matter to me one whit what the religious world thinks about what happened to me. I know what happened to me, and I know who lives within me. I know I'm born again. And so the Bible says right here in Romans 8, 23, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption. To wit, the what? Redemption of the body. Amen. See that? It's the redemption of the body. Now I want you to look at this thing with me. We took it Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 4. Romans 1, 4. The scripture says he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Who did the declaring? God did. God the Father. What did he declare? He legitimized everything Christ ever did on this earth and every word he ever spoke and his existence. The Father legitimized it and says, this is my son. And he brought him forth from the dead. By bringing him forth from the dead, he was declaring to everything that this is my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Bible says that my life is hid with Christ in God, right? My life is. That's what the Bible says. It says that my life is hid with Christ in God. Well, obviously, he's not talking about my biological life, my physical fleshly life. He's not talking about that. He's talking about my spirit life is hid with Christ in God. Now, there's something to get off in that, but I'm not going to do it tonight. But there's something you ought to go home and do some thinking about why he does that. But it's hid with Christ in God. Now, why don't you look at Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation, manifestation of the sons of God. So what is that? We're waiting for the adoption of our bodies. When that takes place, we will be manifested to the world. When the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he was manifested and made known, and that was the saddest day that Satan had ever known. It's when Christ rose from the dead, never could they ever dispute who he was from that point on. He had died fully dead, and he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then on the third day, God raised him from the dead, and by raising him from the dead, he proved that he was his son. Look over here in the book of Acts, chapter number 13, verse 33. Acts chapter 13, verse 33. 
So while Christ was alive, you know, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast out devils. The Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, leaders of the day said, well, you're casting out devils by, by the devil himself, Beelzebub, and this raising of the dead is simply some kind of a, a magic trick. And, and they, they, just, they just discarded everything he did and explained it away and said, we be not born of fornication. You know, we're legitimate. We're the seed of Abraham. We're the sons of Abraham. That's what they said. And, and so they had demonized him. And they put him in the grave. And he died on the cross. And folks, if that's as far as it went, then your faith is vain tonight. But watch how the apostles used that. Acts chapter 13, verse 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Now watch this. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. The second psalm is verse 7, chapter 2. Go back and get that with me if you want to turn to it. Psalm chapter number 2 and verse number 7. Now the writers of the New Testament went straight to the Old Testament scriptures and says here is what it's talking about. Psalm 2 verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah, hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Was the Lord Jesus Christ the son of God before he put flesh on here in this world? Is he eternal? Has he always been? There's never been a time he wasn't. He's always been. He said that before Abraham was, I am. That's a, that's a continuing eternal existence. No past, no present, no future. He is present. He's here. Always is. Always has been. Always will be. Nothing changes that. But what happens here in the book of Psalm, chapter number 2 and verse 7, it says, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. In other words, he said, I'm raising you from the dead so that they'll all know who you are from henceforth. And they do, believe me. The devil, all the demons in hell, everything, every creature, everywhere, knows who the Lord Jesus Christ is. It takes a PhD to be so stupid he doesn't know who he is. Amen. Graduate of Harvard or Princeton or Yale or Brown or one of those places up there, they have a clue. The Son of God, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he arose from the dead, he'll never die again. To be dead one time, one time, never die again. To rise from the dead means that he became victor over the enemy. The enemy's death. Death takes your loved ones away. Death stops your life. Death comes in and seizes upon you. Death, no man, no man hath power over the spirit when it comes to death. You don't have any power over it. But he did. He did. And when he rose from the dead, he broke the power of death. He completely ripped it wide open and came forth from the dead. And death can no longer touch him because it's already done all it can to him. And it can't touch him again. And now he says, because I live, ye shall live also. Rose from the dead. And by that rising from the dead, once again, God declares, that's my son. That's my son. Now, here's what's going to happen to us. You pass from this world, your soul and spirit's present with the Lord. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. If you believe in soul sleep, I don't. That's sad. If you think your loved ones are sleeping out here in the ground somewhere... That's sad. Can you believe in soul sleep and be saved? Yes, you can, but I'll tell you right now, that's, that's not going to give you any peace. I don't, there's nothing out here but memories. That's all that's out there. But if you pass from this world, and we don't know when, but we will. We'll pass from this world. And when we pass from this world, and that's what we do, we leave this world. We don't float around as some ethereal spirit out here, some ghost haunting people. The ghost and all of that stuff are demons, folks. So we're gone. We're present with the Lord. That's what more could you ask than that. But he's going to come again. And when he comes again, he's going to come and he's going to bring his saints with him. But there's going to be a resurrection that takes place. And that resurrection that takes place is when it talks about in Romans chapter number 8, will be the manifestation of the sons of God. At that moment, all creation 
will know without a question who the sons of God are. No doubt about it. And that's important because we'll be going into the millennium for a thousand years on this earth into the millennium. And he said, if you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. In that thousand year period of time, you as a glorified son of God will be reigning right here on this earth. Right here. Amen. Right here. Right here. On this earth. A thousand years. Manifested sons of God. At the end of a thousand years, Satan is so wicked, so vile, so full of hate for Christ that he will be turned loose out of his bottomless pit that he's in for a thousand years and go out to deceive the nations. And when he does, they'll follow him, which opens up an entirely different thing because it tells you that men make their own choices. And in the book of Revelation, neither did they repent, neither did they repent, neither did they repent over and over and over and over and over again. The book of Revelation is, show, is written to show you God's justice, his righteousness, his holiness, and the rebellion of men. Because neither did they repent, neither did they repent, neither did they repent. So repentance is right in the heart and soul of it. You can't get, you can't get, you, there's, if there's no repentance, there's no salvation. Don't let somebody flim-flam you and start using terms like lordship salvation. If all you do is believe a bunch of stuff up here in your head, you think that's grace. That's not grace. Grace, is, grace convicts you and draws you with the power of God to God through, Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing that, you receive him as your Lord. And in receiving him, it makes a change inside you and you repent. The repentance will flow like a river. Amen. God doesn't save you because you repent. He saves you because you believe. But if you believe, you'll repent. It's that simple. Repent or perish, John the Baptist says. Now, <clears throat> here we are tonight. I call him my father. And I feel comfortable saying that. The other Hebrew word for it over there in Romans 8 and this one here in Galatians 4 is Abba. Abba, Father. The Lord Jesus Christ used that term many times when he was praying to the Father. He called him Abba, Father, because he was his Father, Abba, Father. It's an endearing term. It's a precious, close term. Is he your Father? Then you call him Abba, Father. Right now, I can pray that you're born again. I can pray that the Spirit of Christ is in you and that we have fellowship around the things that matter. And I pray I, that is so. But the day will come when there will be no doubt in anybody's mind who we belong to. Because it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he comes, when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And when he does come, the, manifest, the sons of God will be manifested. The heavens will roll back like a scroll. And he will appear in the heavens. And the sons of Jacob will see him and they'll mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son that's when salvation will come out of Zion that's when the Jew will be saved it's when they see him come at his appearing and all the saints of God with him I've been adopted I'm born again but he's adopted me he's given me legal standing to inherit Everything that is mine to inherit. He gives me legal standing that I can come into his house, sit at his table. He has gives me legal standing that when I approach him, I don't approach him just as a believer. I approach him as a son. The idea is, uh, would you please move over a little bit here? This is my son. He's got a special place at the table. Amen. Uh, angels, a little bit here. Okay, there you go. A little bit further. Son. Come on up here. Sit down next to me at my table. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you can hear a pen drop in here. The Bible says right now we're made a little lower than the angels. And Christ was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But we won't always be a little lower than angels. The time will come when you'll even judge angels. Amen. 
sons of God. Father, bless your word. And bless it to the hearing of the people. I know the word is alive. I get the distinct feeling when I'm reading it, it's reading me. It speaks, it sees, it hears, because it's living. And I pray that that word that went forth tonight will go forth for the purpose that you intended. You said it would in Isaiah 55. You say it will go forth for the purpose you intended. It's not my place to call what the intention is. That's yours. But Father, for those that hear it over the internet, hear it in this house, hear it on television later, somewhere later, a DVD or something, I ask you to bless it, Lord, and bless our Lord Jesus Christ. In his holy name I pray. Our heads are bowed tonight. I don't want anybody looking. Sunday night after the service had ended, a young man came up to me right over there, and he walked up to me and he said, what do I need to do to be saved? Well, now that doesn't happen every day. He said, what do I need to do to be saved? I said, let's go down here. And I got down here, opened up the Bible, and took him to Romans 10. I said, do you see this verse 13? Yes. I said, it says, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm sure he said within his soul, then that's talking to me. That's right. Whosoever covers a big area, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. No formula in there. Just call on him. You need him? Call on him. You believe on him? Call on him. I asked him this before he prayed. I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He said, yes. I said, do you believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day? He said, yes, I believe that. I said, let's pray. And so when we got down there, I prayed, and I said, now you ask God in your own words from your own heart ask him save you come into your soul come into your heart whatever you want to say to God you call out to him right now because you're calling upon the name of the Lord so he got down there and he did that and I got up and I looked at him I said you did what God said to do in his word he had a smile on his face he said I did didn't didn't I, I said yes you did I said now you believe your life is going to change somebody's moved in to take over in your life May God bless you and may God be with you. I hope all of you tonight in this house have had something similar to that happen to you. Everybody didn't have the, something like I had where I went into a deep conviction. Oh, man, I wanted to die. But then God saved my soul. And when he did, he lifted me up, took that burden off of me. It's hard to explain unless you've been there. You know what I'm talking about. We're your friend. God's for you. Who can be against you? If you've never had that happen to you, if you've never really come into a saving understanding with the Lord Jesus Christ, where you personally have received him your own way, but you've brought him into your heart. If you haven't had that happen, you can tonight. You can do it right now. You can come down here and we'll pray with you. You can know before you walk out this house tonight that you know that you know that you know that it's all right now. Nothing between the Lord and me. Father, bless your word now and those who heard it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, God bless you for listening to me. If you don't get anything else out of what I said tonight, just remember these two words. State, every believer is born of the Spirit of God. Standing. Is when God, when you allow God to bring you into a place of adoption where you receive that, and God will bring you into places that you've never known even existed. They're for you, they're for me, they're for all of us. Hallelujah. Amen.